America by Franz Kafka Chapter 1 As he entered New York Harbor on the now slow-moving ship, Carl Rossmann, a 17-year-old youth who had been sent to America by his poor parents because a servant girl had seduced him and borne a child by him, saw the Statue of Liberty, which he had been observing for some time, as if in a sudden burst of sunlight. The arm with the sword now reached aloft, and about her figure blew the free winds. So high, he said to himself, and although he still had no thoughts of leaving, he found himself being pushed gradually toward the rail by an ever-swelling throng of porters. In passing, a young man, whom he knew from the voyage, said, So you don't feel like getting off yet? Oh, I'm ready, all right, said Carl with a laugh. And in his exuberance, sturdy lad that he was, he lifted his trunk up on his shoulders. But looking out over his acquaintance, who swung his walking stick several times as he set off with the other passengers, he realized that he had forgotten his umbrella below deck. Quickly, he asked his acquaintance, who seemed not at all pleased whether he would be so kind as to wait there for a moment with his trunk, surveying the scene quickly so he could find his bearings on his return, and hurried off. Downstairs, he was disappointed to find a passageway that would have certainly shortened his path, blocked off for the first time, probably on account of all those disembarking passengers, and was obliged to make his way late laboriously through numerous small rooms, corridors that constantly turned off, many short stairs in rapid succession, and an empty room with an abandoned desk, until, at last, having gone that way only once or twice, and always in company, he had quite lost his way. In his uncertainty, not encountering a soul and hearing only the constant scraping of a thousand human feet above him, and from a distance, like a last gasp the final workings of the engine being shut down, he began without further reflection to knock at random on a little door before which he had halted. It's open, cried a voice from within, and, signing with genuine relief, Carl stepped into the cabin. Why do you have to bang on the door like a madman? A huge man asked, almost without looking at Carl. Through a skylight somewhere, a dull light, already expended on the upper decks, fell into the miserable cabin, where a bed, a closet, a chair, and the man were packed side by side, as if in storage. I've lost my way, said Carl. On the voyage over, I never really noticed what a terribly big ship this is. Yes, you're right. The man said with a certain pride as he tinkered with the lock on a small suitcase, which he opened and closed continually with both hands, listening for the bolts to snap into place. But do come in, the man continued. You're hardly going to stand there like that. Am I not disturbing you? Carol asked. How could you disturb me? Are you a German? Carl sought to assure himself, for he had heard a great deal about the dangers facing newcomers in America especially from Irishmen. Yes, yes, said the man. Carl continued to hesitate. Suddenly the man seized the door handle and pulled Carl into the cabin along with the door, which he promptly shut. I simply cannot stand having people stare at me from the corridor, the man said, toying with his trunk again. Everyone who walks by looks in. Who could possibly stand that? But the corridor is completely empty, said Carl, who was pressed uncomfortably against the bedpost. It is now, said the man. When else but now, thought Carl. It's not easy talking to this man. Lie down on the bed. That'll give you a bit more room, said the man. Carl crawled in as best he could, laughing loudly at his initially futile attempt to swing himself onto the bed. No sooner was he lying down that he cried, Oh, my goodness, I forgot all about my trunk. Well, where is it? Up on deck. An acquaintance of mine is keeping an eye on it. Let me see. His name is... From the secret pocket his mother had attached to the lining of his coat, Carl drew a visiting card. Butterbomb. Franz Butterbomb. Do you really need that trunk? Of course I do. Then why did you give it to a stranger? 
I had forgotten my umbrella below deck, so I ran to get it, but didn't want to drag along my trunk. And then I got lost. You're alone? Unaccompanied? Yes, I'm alone. Perhaps I should stick with this man, thought Carl. For where else could I find a better friend just now? And you've lost your trunk too. Not to mention your umbrella. And the man sat down on the chair as though he had begun to take an interest in Carl's affair. But I don't believe that my trunk is lost. Blessed are those who believe, said the man, giving his thick, short, dark hair a vigorous scratching. People's conduct on board ship varies from one port to the next. In Hamburg, your friend Butterbaum might have looked after your trunk, but here both will probably disappear without a trace. Well, in that case, I'll have to check up on deck at once, said Carl, looking around for a way out. Stay, the man said, and putting his hand on Carl's chest, pushed him roughly back onto the bed. But why? asked Carl, who had become annoyed. It makes no sense, said the man. I'll be leaving in a moment, and we can go together. Either the trunk has been stolen, in which case it's hopeless, and you can moan about it till the end of your days, or that person is still looking after it, in which case he's an idiot and should keep on looking after it, or else he's just an honest man who has left the trunk there, and it'll be easier to find if we wait till the ship has emptied out completely. The same goes for your umbrella. Do you know your way around the ship? Carl asked suspiciously, for he believed there must be some hidden flaw in the otherwise convincing notion that his belongings could be more easily found when the ship was empty. But I'm a stoker, said the man. You are a stoker, Carl cried with delight, as if this announcement surpassed all his expectations, and propping up on his elbows, he took a closer look at the man. One could see into the engine room through a hatch next to the cabin in which I slept in with the Slovaks. Yes, that's where I worked, said the stoker. I've always been very interested in technology, said Carl, following his own train of thought. It would no doubt have eventually become an engineer if I hadn't gone away to America. But why did you have to go away? Ah, well, said Carl, dismissing the entire affair with a wave of his hand. At the same time, he smiled at the stoker, as though seeking indulgence concerning matters that he had not disclosed. But there must have been a reason, said the stoker and one could not tell whether he was requesting an explanation or attempting to forestall one. I too could become a stoker, said Carl. My parents no longer care what I do. There will be an opening for my job, said the stoker. And basking in this knowledge, he put his hands in his trouser pockets and stretched out by swinging his legs, which were clad in creased leather-like iron-gray trousers, onto the bed. Carl had to move closer to the wall. You're leaving ship? Oh yes, we're marching off today. But why? Don't you like it here? Well, that's just how it is. One's own preferences aren't always taken into account. Besides, you're right, I don't like it here. In any case, you're probably not completely set on becoming a stoker, though that's actually when it's most likely to happen. So I strongly advise against it. If you want to study in Europe, why wouldn't you want to study here? The American universities are, of course, incomparably better. That may be so, said Carl, but I have barely any money to pay for my studies. I once read about someone who worked for a business by day and studied at nights till he became a doctor and then, I believe, a mayor. But that takes great perseverance, doesn't it? And that's something I'm afraid I lack. Besides, I wasn't an especially good student, and it wasn't that hard for me to leave school. And the schools over here may be even stricter. I hardly know any English. In any case, people here are often very prejudiced against foreigners. So you already run into this too? In that case, everything is fine. Then you're my man. You see, we're on a German ship. It belongs to the Hamburg-America line. So why aren't all of us here German? Why is the chief machinist a Romanian? His name is Shubal. It's really incredible. And that scoundrel mistreats us Germans on a German ship. Now, I don't want you to get the idea, he was out of breath now and fanned himself with his hand, that I'm complaining for the sake of complaining. I know you've no influence and are only a poor little fellow. But this is too awful. 
and he pounded several times on the table, keeping his eyes on his fist as he did so. I've served on so many ships. He reeled off 20 names as if they were a single word. Carl became very confused. Made my mark, got praised. All of the captains greatly appreciated my work and even spent several years serving on the same merchant vessel. He stood up as if this were the high point of his life. And here, on this tube, where everything is kept on such a tight leash, where one may not even joke around, I'm useless, always get in Shubo's way, am simply a lazy bones who deserves to be thrown out, and am paid only out of pity. Can you understand that? I certainly can't. You shouldn't stand for it, Carl said in an agitated voice. So at home did he feel on the stoker's bed that he had almost lost the feeling that he stood on the uncertain ground of a ship moored off the coast of an unfamiliar continent. Have you been to the captain? Have you stopped to obtain your rights from him? Oh, go away. Just go away. I don't want you here. You don't listen to what I have to say and then try to give me advice. How could I possibly go to the captain? And the stoker sat down wearily, burying his face in both hands. I couldn't have given him any better advice, Carl said to himself. It occurred to him that he should have fetched his trunk rather than remain here and make suggestions only to hear them dismiss the stupid. On entrusting him with the trunk, his father had asked him in jest, How long will you hang on to it? And now the expensive trunk was perhaps lost, and the only consolation was that his father would not discover anything about his present circumstances, even if he were to make inquiries. All the shipping company could say was that he had reached New York. Carl did regret, though, that he had barely made use of the belongings in his suitcase, especially since he should have changed his shirt some time ago. So he had been economizing in the wrong places. Now, at the outset of his new career, precisely when he needed to appear in clean clothes, he would have to turn up in a dirty shirt. What wonderful prospects! Otherwise, the loss of the trunk wouldn't have been so bad, since the suit he wore was better than the one in the trunk, which was meant only for emergencies and had been patched by his mother shortly before he left. He remembered now that there was still a piece of Veronese salami in the trunk, which his mother had packed as an extra present, but of which he had eaten only the tiniest portion, for he had not had much of an appetite during the voyage, and the soup handed out in the steerage had more than sufficed. He would have liked to get his hands on the sausage so that he could bequeath it to the stoker. For one could gain the confidence of such people quite easily, merely by slipping them a little something. Carl knew this from his father, who had gained the confidence of all the lower ranking employees he dealt with by handling out cigarettes. All that remained for Carl was to give away a little money, but now that he had perhaps lost his trunk, he did not want to touch that for the moment. His thoughts returned to the trunk, and he could no longer understand why he had even bothered to keep such close watch over his trunk that he had barely slept, only to let somebody relieve him of it so easily. He recalled the five nights he had lain in bed, always suspecting that a little Slovak two beds away had his eyes on the trunk. That Slovak had awaited the moments when Karl would at last succumb to weakness and doze off so that he would then be able to take the long stick with which he had played or possibly practiced all day and pull the trunk over to his bed. By day, the Slovak looked fairly innocent, but when darkness fell, he would rise occasionally from his bed and look over at Carl's trunk with a mournful expression on his face. Carl could observe this very clearly, for there was always someone prey to an immigrant's unease who would turn on a little light, even though the ship's regulations expressly forbade this, an attempt to decipher the incomprehensible brochures put out by the immigration agencies. But if there was such a light nearby... Carl could doze off for a while, but if it was some distance away or the room was dark, he had to keep his eyes open. These exertions had left him quite exhausted and had perhaps been in vain. Woe betide that butter bomb should he ever run into him again. Just then, interrupting the perfect silence, came the sound of little short taps as of children's feet approaching from afar. As they came closer, the sound grew louder and now was that of the steadily marching men. They seemed to advance in a single file, and was only natural in this narrow passageway. One could hear a clashing as of weapons. <laughs>
about to stretch out in bed and fall asleep, freed at last from all concerns about trunks and Slovaks. Carl gave a start and nudged the stoker as so as to alert him, since the head of the procession appeared to have reached the door. It's the ship's band, said the stoker. They played up on deck and are going inside to pack. Everything's ready, so we can leave. Come on. Taking Carl by the hand, he at the last moment seized a picture of the Madonna from the wall above his bed, stuffed it into his breast pocket, grabbed his trunk, and left the cabin quickly with Carl. I'm going to the office to give these gentlemen a piece of my mind. There's nobody around anymore, so it's no longer necessary to watch what one says, the stoker said repeatedly, using a variety of formulations, and without breaking stride gave a few side kicks to flatten the rats that had crossed its path, but he merely succeeded in driving it even more quickly into its hole, which it reached just in time. Besides, his movements were slow, for though he had very long legs, they nonetheless weighed him down. They passed through a section of the kitchen where some girls in dirty aprons, which they wet deliberately, were washing dishes in great tubs. The stoker caught over a certain line, put his arms around her hips, and as she pressed coquettishly against his arm, swept her along for a moment. It's payday. You want to come along? he asked. Why should I bother? You can bring me my money, she replied, and slipping out from under his arm, ran off. So where did you pick up that pretty boy? She cried out again, without expecting a reply. One could hear laughter from all of the girls, who had interrupted their work. Nevertheless, they continued on the way, and soon reached a door capped with a little pediment supported by small gilded caryatides. As a fixture on the ship, it looked very extravagant. Carl realized he had never entered this area, which was probably reserved during the voyage for first and second class passengers. But just before the great ship cleaning, the partition doors had been taken down. Indeed, they had already encountered several men carrying brooms on their shoulders who had greeted the stoker. Carl marveled at the bustle. In steerage, he had for sure witnessed little of this. Also, there were electrical cords strung along both sides of the corridor, and one could hear a little bell ringing continuously. The stoker knocked on the door respectfully, and when a voice cried, Come in, he motioned to Carl that he should enter without trepidation. He complied, but did not advance far beyond the door. Through the room's three windows, Carl could see the ocean waves, and as she watched the cheerful movements, his heart began to beat more rapidly, as though he had not spent five long days gazing uninterruptedly at the sea. Large ships cross one another's paths, yielding to the rolling waves only insofar as their weights permitted. If one narrowed one's eyes, the ships seemed to rock under the pressure of their weight. Upon their masts were narrow but elongated flags that, though tautened by the ship's motion, still flapped to and fro. The sound of gun salutes could be heard, probably from warships. As reflected on a glistening coat of steel, the cannon barrels of one such passing ship seemed almost coddled by its smooth, steady, not quite so straightforward progress through the waves. At least from one's position by the door one could catch but a distant glimpse of the huge number of small ships and boats constantly slipping through the gaps between the large ships. Behind all this, however, stood New York, gazing at Carl with the hundred thousand windows of its skyscrapers. In this room, one knew where one was. Sitting at a round table were three gentlemen, one an officer in the blue uniform of the ship, the other two Harbor Authority officials in black American uniforms. Piled high on the table were various documents, which the ship's officer first skimmed, pen in hand, before passing them to the other two, who now read them, now copied out passages, now put them in their briefcases, unless the official who made almost continuous little grinding noises with his teeth happened to be dictating a transcript to his colleague. By a desk at the window, with his back to the door, sat a smallish gentleman who was occupied with great folio ledgers, which were lined up before him on a sturdy bookshelf at head level. Beside him stood an open cash box, which, at least at first glance, was empty. The second window, which was vacant, afforded the best view. 
At the third, however, stood two gentlemen, speaking in undertones. One, leaning against the window and dressed in the ship's uniform, toyed with the handle of his sword. His interlocutor, who stood facing the window, moved a little now and then, exposing the row of decorations on the other man's chest. The latter wore civilian clothes and carried a small, thin bamboo stick that, owing to the way both hands rested on his hips, stood out like a sword. Carl had little time to gaze at everything, for before long an attendant approached him, looked at the stoker as though he did not belong there, and asked him what he wanted. Responding as softly as he had been asked, the stoker said that he wished to speak to the chief Broussard. The attendant dismissed this request with a wave of his hand, but nevertheless tiptoeing in a wide arc around the circular table, he approached the gentleman beside the folios. At last, that gentleman, who, as one could see quite clearly, almost froze on hearing the attendant's words, looked around at the man who wished to speak to him, dismissed the stoker with a vehement gesture, and, just to be sure, the attendant likewise. The latter returned to the stoker, and, as if imparting a confidence, said, Get out at once! Upon hearing these words, the stoker gazed down at Carl, as though Carl were a sweetheart to whom he was silently pouring out his woes. Without further reflection, Carl broke free, ran straight across the room, and even brushed up against the officer's chair. The servant ran after him, bent low, arms ready to make a catch, as though chasing vermin, but Carl reached the chief's Broussard's table first and clung to it in case the servant should try to pull him away. All of a sudden, the entire room became animated. The ship's officer jumped up from the table. The gentleman from the port authority watched, calmly but alertly. The two gentlemen at the window now stood side by side. The attendant, believing his presence was no longer required, since even the distinguished gentlemen were now taking an interest in the matter, stepped aside. By the door, the stoker waited intently for the moments when his help would be needed again. And finally, the chief broussard in his armchair swiveled sharply to the right. Carl rummaged through his secret pockets, which he had no hesitation in showing to these people, took out his passport, and rather than saying a few words by ways of introduction, simply laid it down open on the table. The chief broussard seemed to attach little significance to the passport, for he flicked it aside with two fingers, whereupon Carl put it away, as though the formality had been satisfactorily resolved. If I may say so, he began, I believe that the stoker has been treated unjustly. There's a certain Shubo on board who's been giving him trouble. He served in the most satisfactory manner on many ships. He can give you their names. Is diligent? Does his work on good faith? And so it's rather difficult to understand how he could possibly be ill-suited for a job on this particular ship, where the work is not so exceedingly difficult as, say, on merchant vessels. So, those slanderous allegations are all that stands between him and the advancement and recognition that would otherwise be his due. I've addressed this manner only in the most general terms. He himself will inform you about the specific complaints. Carl has directed his remarks at all of the gentlemen, since everybody was indeed listening, and it seemed much more likely that there should be a fair-minded person in their midst than the fair-minded one should happen to be the chief Broussard. Carl had, to be sure, neglected to mention that he had not known the stoker long. Also, he would have come up with an even better speech had he not been distracted by the red face of that gentleman with the little bamboo stick, and indeed it was only now from this new vantage point that he had his first noticed him. It's all true, word for word. Before anyone had asked him a question, let alone glanced in his direction, the impulsiveness of the stoker would have been a grave mistake if the gentleman with the decorations, who, as Carl now realized, was indeed a captain, had not already decided to hear out the stoker. The captain reached out his hand and called to the stoker, Come here, in a voice so firm that one could have almost hit it with a hammer. And now everything depended on how the stoker conducted himself, for Carl had no doubt about the justice of his case. Fortunately, it soon became clear that the stoker was a man who had seen a great deal of the world. With exemplary composure, he reached into his little suitcase, and on his first attempt pulled out a little bundle of papers in a notebook. And then, 
as if this were the most obvious course of action. Completely ignoring the chief broussard, he went over to the captain and spread out his evidence on the window sill. The chief broussard had no alternative but to join them. That fellow is a notorious crank, he said by way of explanation. He spends more time in the broussard's office than in the machine room and has driven even Shubal, who is such a calm man, to despair. Now listen to me once and for all, he said, addressing the stoker. You've been too far intrusive. How often have you been justifiably thrown out of the disbursement rooms for continually making such demands, which always turns out to be completely unreasonable? How often have you run over from those rooms to the main cash office? How often were you politely informed that Shubo is your immediate superior and that you, as his subordinate, must learn to live with him? And you even coming here when the captain is present. You're not ashamed to disturb him and dare to bring along this little fellow whom you've taught to reel off your fatuous accusations and whom I'm now seeing for the first time on board. Carl had to restrain himself from intervening. However, the captain had already approached them and said, But let's listen to what the man has to say. In any case, I think Shubal has become too much independent of late, though this doesn't necessarily speak in your favor. Those last words were directed at the stoker. Of course, it was only natural that the captain could not take a side right away, but otherwise everything seemed to be going well. The stoker launched into his explanations and, overcoming his reluctance, began by addressing Shubal as Mr. This greatly pleased Carl, who stood by the chief broussard's deserted desk, pressing the letter scales repeatedly in sheer delight. Mr. Shubal is unfair. Mr. Shubal gives preferential treatments to foreigners. Mr. Shubal banished a stoker from the engine room and made him clean toilets, which was certainly not his responsibility. At one point, the stoker even questioned the competence of Mr. Shubal, which was, he acclaimed, more apparent than real. Whereupon Carl directed a most intense look at the captain, assuming an engagingly collegial expression merely so as to prevent such an awkward manner of speaking from disposing the captain unfavorably toward the stoker. There was indeed little enough to be gleaned from the latter's many speeches, and although the captain continued to stare into space with eyes that showed his determination to hear out the stoker, the other gentlemen were becoming impatient, and ominously enough, the stoker's voice no longer held sway in the room. The gentleman in civilian clothes was the first to move, stirring his little bamboo stick and tapping the parquois floor with it, if ever so lightly. Every now and then, the other gentleman glanced over. Clearly in a hurry, the gentlemen from the harbor authority returned to their files and began to peruse them, if still rather absently. The ship's officer returned to his position beside his table, and believing that he had carried the day, the chief broussard heaved a great ironic sigh. The only person who was evidently immune from this general distraction was the attendant, who could at least partially sympathize with the sorrows of a poor man who had suddenly been set down amid the mighty, and who nodded gravely at Carl, as though wishing to explain something. Meanwhile, beyond the windows, the life of the harbor went on. A flat cargo ship transporting a huge pile of barrels, which must have been marvelously well stacked to prevent the rolling about, passed by, plunging the room into almost complete darkness. Little motorboats, which Carl could have observed more closely if only he had had the time, rushed straight ahead, guided by the jerking hand of a man who stood erect at the steering wheel. Now and then peculiar floating objects bobbed up from the choppy waters of their own accord, only to be quickly covered and to sink before one's startled eyes. Perspiring sailors rowed away from the ocean steamers and boats filled with passengers who remained seated expectantly, mostly in silence, in the same seats into which they had been pressed, although some could not refrain from turning their heads to gaze at the changing scenery. There was endless motion and unrest born from the restless elements to helpless men in their works. But although everything cried out for haste, clarity, and the most precise description, what did the stoker do? He had certainly talked himself into a sweat and was no longer able to hold the papers on the windowsill in his trembling hands. He kept thinking of new complaints about Shubo from every conceivable angle, each of which would, he believed, 
have sufficed to demolish Shubal, although he had managed to give the captain only a pathetic mismatch of all that. For some time now, the gentleman with the little bamboo stick had been whistling softly at the ceiling. The gentleman from the harbor authority had detained the officer at their table and gave no sign that they were about to release him. Only the composure shown by the captain made the chief Bussar refrain from bursting in, as he longed to do. The attendant, who stood at attention, awaited an imminent order from his captain with regard to the stoker. 